Hey, good morning. Welcome back. We're in the book of Exodus. We're now at chapter 10, verse 1, and I think right here what I want to do is let, let's go ahead and talk about the hardening of the heart. We're going to take a few extra minutes probably this morning. Let's read the verse here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them. All right, so today we're just going to take that one verse. God says here that he has hardened Pharaoh's heart. So what is this? There's a whole issue going on here of free will. Uh, did, did God force Moses to be lost? Did, you know, how does this all work out? Because sometimes there's, well, we'll look at some references here. There's about 20 of these, and many times it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and there's uh, many times that say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's an interesting study here. So uh, we've been looking at this. We're 10 chapters in, a 40-chapter book. And so uh, we're about a fourth of the way now. But I wanted to share a couple of bits here, and I was going to wait till uh, the ninth plague after that, but I thought, really, we're not going to gain anything by waiting, so let's just take it on. And, and I want to just share some business. I've, I've kind of condensed some stuff down and left out a lot of stuff, but I do have a, a couple of extended quotations I want to share with you from a couple of the key Bible commentaries I've been looking at. Uh, we don't look to the Bible commentaries as an authority, but sometimes there's a lot of insight that, that comes there because people are really focusing on the text. So from Stewart's commentary, let me read an extended portion here, and I think this is the most insight. Uh, we'll talk about this briefly. So he says in his commentary, Egyptian religious texts speak often of the heart as the representation of a person's basic essence, the place where a person's guilt and innocence, motives, and general righteousness are to be found. In Egyptian thinking... The evaluation of the heart by the gods at the time of a person's death was a means of determining whether or not one is a sinner and therefore whether or not one can go to the Egyptian equivalent of heaven. The Egyptian pharaoh was supposed to be a pure person, a divine manifestation of the gods, and one whose sovereignty over the people was credential in part by the purity of his heart. The idea that Yahweh could do whatever he wanted with pharaoh's heart and specifically could harden it therefore was an evidence of Yahweh's control of all things, including the mightiest monarch of the day, and also an evidence that Yahweh had done to Pharaoh what the gods would, would usually have done with him, to weigh the heart and decide whether it was worthy of eternal life or not. In effect, then, each time Yahweh is described as hardening Pharaoh's heart, the alert reader is reminded that Yahweh had, as it were, weighed Pharaoh, or judged Pharaoh, and found him wanting. Thus, God disgraced Pharaoh. God had reduced the supposedly divine Pharaoh to the level of a mere mortal, easily manipulated and possessing no divine purity at all. That's not Stuart's exact words. I've kind of condensed it, uh, some of it there. But yeah, this is an interesting piece, isn't it? That on the Egyptian, on the basis of Egyptian thinking, Pharaoh would be uh, judged by the gods, ultimately, what his character was, what he was made out of. Is he, is he worthy of, of truly being, you know, Pharaoh and all that? So you see, Pharaoh's to be kind of above everything else. He's not to be manipulable. He's, he's a divinely helped guy, helped by all these important div div divinities, deities of Egypt. And for Yahweh to come in and, and slap him around, I mean, I guess that's not the way we want to think of it here, but Yahweh comes in and has his way. Yahweh is, is stronger. The God of the Hebrews is stronger than the God of the Egyptians. And of course, of course, because the gods of the Egyptians are all false. They're just ideas. They don't really exist. They're, they're masks which Satan stands behind, a little creature, Satan. And God, the God of heaven and earth, the creator God, he's the real deal. So yeah, yeah, these, the crocodile God, isn't. it doesn't turn out too well here. And all his buddies there. So so, yeah, it's an interesting picture here how God humbles Pharaoh. God shows that he's just a mere mortal. He puts on his socks the same way as everybody else. And so the Egyptians have had their gods uh, ransacked. And now the Pharaoh is pretty much being ransacked. And they're learning that they aren't in control of everything. And their deities aren't really worth the plastic label on the container. Anyway, not just Stuart, but I thought Stuart's comments were fascinating because they they kind of show us what God's doing. He's humbling Pharaoh. 
He's showing that he's a mere mortal. He's showing that he's manipulable. And that is an important uh, distinction here. Now, let me give you just a few other remarks from Hamilton's commentary, because Hamilton has a lot of interesting business to say. And I don't often quote from Hamilton, but a couple lines here. Uh, just some of these are kind of facts. Some form of hardness of heart language occurs 20 times between Exodus 4 and Exodus 14, those chapters. There is an exactly 50-50 breakdown in the 20 uses of these verbs in Exodus 4 to 14 with regard to the subject of the verb. 10 times the subject is Yahweh, and 10 times the subject of the verb is either Pharaoh or Pharaoh's heart. Even after the Lord has hardened Pharaoh's heart for the first time in plague number 6, Pharaoh was able to harden his own heart at the end of the very next plague, plague 7. If you read it in the text, there it is. This shows that the Lord's initial hardening of Pharaoh's heart does not once and for all terminate Pharaoh's ability to act of his own accord. After the seventh plague, however, the door on further autonomous behavior is slammed shut. The Lord does the hardening in plagues 8, 9, and 10. So some kind of interesting uh, analysis there from Hamilton, which, which does comport with the text. That is what the way the text it does lay out that way in the text that way. So what are we to make of all this hardening of the heart business? Uh, is God, are we just puppets and God is kind of putting on a play? Well, remember that God may not only harden a heart, and this isn't common language throughout the Bible. This is especially strong in this showdown with Pharaoh and Exodus. God not only hardens hearts, but he softens hearts. In fact, I would argue if we really take, take a stock, take inventory of all this, most of God's business is softening hearts that are already hard. Now also here's a thought too. Surely to the degree that any decisions that Pharaoh makes are not, he's not in charge of those decisions. They don't represent his decision, but something that is imposed or forced upon him. He wouldn't be held responsible. In other words, he wouldn't be lost on the basis of a decision that he made that he didn't really make, you know, that somebody kind of forced him to make. So Pharaoh's only going to be saved and lost on the basis of his own standing his own personal uh, position with reference to, to the true God, Pharaoh's not going to be lost based on decisions that are outside his control. Neither will you or I be lost based on decisions that are outside of our control. Now, there is another piece to this, too, and I want you to think about this, and that is that often we place ourselves in a situation where, think of the person who, who takes drugs, who drinks, the drunk driver, let's take that example, uh, he is making a choice while he does have ability to choose. He makes a choice to become inebriated. He makes a choice to basically take so much uh, of that substance that he impacts his own ability to make decisions and he blunts his ability to think wisely. And so now he goes around and does crazy, he's uninhibited, he does crazy stuff, he goes driving and, and, and there's terrible outcomes. People are killed and slaughtered and all that. And so, yeah, maybe he would plead, well, I was drunk. I wasn't responsible for my actions at that time. Well, yes, guess what? When you made the decision to, to consume that alcohol, you, at that time, you basically became accountable for everything you would do having done that terrible thing, having surrendered, having willy-nilly just thrown away your self-control. Uh, yeah, you're responsible for that. Yeah, you know, you, you're, you're responsible there. So once we start on a set of decisions and then those decisions affect or impact how we think and how we make the next decision, you see kind of how the train goes. We make, you make one bad decision, it leads to another and another. You know, it's the classic, it's like the gambler's dilemma. Once somebody has put a bunch of money on, on uh, some gambling thing, then uh, they, they feel like they've invested, you know, the, the, the odds are going to even out. If I just keep on going, I'm going to get my money back. So they can keep throwing good money after bad money. Only the trouble is that that doesn't, statistically, that doesn't work that way. But each roll of the dice doesn't require that it's going to put you in the right place and you're going to get your money back. So every time you make a bad decision, you, you operate against God's kingdom. You force yourself in opposition against the God of heaven and earth you are making it harder for yourself to come back. You're, you're strengthening pride. And this is what Pharaoh was doing. By his own choice, he was choosing to be an opponent of the God of heaven and earth and to place himself in opposition. So he is accountable for that. And we are all accountable for our own decisions that we make that are putting us into a, a contrary spot with God. So yes, we have free will. And God here... It does achieve some things that is, are fit toward his purposes, and we'll talk about some of that tomorrow morning. But uh, but keep in mind here, 
when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's hearts, that's about half of them here. You know, about half of them, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and the other ones talk about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. So, yeah, be careful with this. Don't uh, think we're all just puppets and God just kind of forces his way. The normal thing is that God pleads, he appeals, and he does not transgress boundaries. But when we make ourselves an enemy of God, yeah, lots of stuff can happen that we really would rather not to happen. So Pharaoh uh, got into the wrong spot here, and he couldn't seem to bring himself ever to back out of it. So just some thoughts here about the hardening of the heart. Don't charge God with being a puppet master. Pharaoh had, had a lot of opportunities, but God uh, is going to teach a lesson, a broader scale lesson to all the Egyptians and to Pharaoh. And part of that, he overrides the will of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh is right on target to be God's enemy. So there's kind of an overlap there, isn't there? Uh, it seems to be coming out. Well, we're heading up on into the plague, so let's carry on. I guess the lesson to us is we should take our decisions about God and God's things very carefully. Remember, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but wants that all would come to repentance. So his purpose is not to destroy anyone. His purpose is to save as many as possible. And just when we come to applying this to you and I, no, we're probably, you're probably not a guy who's in charge of a country. I'm not a guy that's in charge of a country. What I have is I'm in charge of me. God has made me in charge of me. And I want to let God transform me and make me more and more and more like Jesus. May God do that for each of us as we carry on. All right, let's keep on working our way through the book of Exodus. And there's some big fireworks still coming up. Let's see it tomorrow morning.